Good morning, everyone. Um, as I was introduced, Martin Glick, I'm head of the bar department at Ascot Drummond um, with specialist bar accountants. Um, as the three of us on the panel today, and we didn't want to uh, duplicate what we're going to talk about, I'm going to concentrate on um, the Inns of Courts and the scholarships and the awards that are available from, from the four Inns of Courts. Um, the, the awards are also split between the GDL um, and the professional training course uh, and I will talk about those individually as well. There are other awards that, that are not really relevant at this stage, I think, to you, so I, I won't cover those. Um, I think it's important to point out at the beginning, just to remember that, and, and I think the one thing I wanted to say was that there's nothing new that I'm gonna tell you. You know, so I appreciate your coming, but whatever I'm telling you is in the public domain. All I'm doing is reinforcing it and just reminding you and, and hopefully bringing it all together. So the important thing to remember is that you can't make more than one application for a scholarship or award um, to more than one in. They all talk, they all communicate, they all share information. So you've got four ins of courts. If you're going to make an application, you have to pick the right one. Um, you can make applications subsequent years, um, but again, only to one in. So you've got to focus on the in that's going to be, do you think you stand the best chance of success if you're going to, to apply for an award from that? So do your homework. Um, and I'll talk about the differences in the inns and I mean there's not a great deal of differences but there are some. What are the inns looking for? Um, they're looking for intellectual ability, the ability to conduct legal research and give written advice as demonstrated by performances at school and university exams. <laughs> they're looking for motivation to succeed at the bar, uh, knowledge of the profession and the courts and steps taken to acquire the personal skills required of a barrister. Your potential as an advocate. To me, this is you know, that's what it's all about. I see lots of barristers over the years, and sometimes even I wonder, you know, whether they've got the actual potential to be a barrister. So, potential as an advocate, both in oral and written skills. This can include applicants' experience in public speaking, mooting, debating, uh, part participating in mock advocacy exams uh, exercises, and personal qualities. Uh, the qualities required of members of the bar include self-reliance, independence, integrity reliability and the capacity to effectively with clients, colleagues and chamber staff. Um, it's important, you know, it, chambers are, you know, it's a group of people coming together, you're all independent people um, and you have to get on with people, particularly the staff, the, the chamber staff and, and the clerking system. Um, Lincoln's in. So uh, I'm going to give these ins in the order of the size of their awards. So Lincoln's in uh, provide the largest amount of awards of all the four ends um, and provide awards for both the GDL, uh, which they refer to as CPE, and BPTC. Um, the amount of awards they gave last year, the information is sometimes a bit sketchy. Um, it's not a guaranteed amount. They, they Obviously, they fundraise all the, all the ends to, to raise scholarship money um, and awards not just on merit but on need. So there isn't a set amount that they award, uh, even individuals. It's very much based on what your needs are, personal financial needs. So each year it changes. But for the GDL, they set aside about £150,000 uh, for awards, which was made up of 32 individual scholarships of £7,000 each. And for the BPTC, um, just over £1.3 million, um, which provided 70 scholarships, ranging from 6000 to 18000 and they had four, four, much. They have forty smaller bursaries of up to three thousand, and it's always up to and ranging from because they're just not set amounts. Um, the thing to know about Lincoln's Inn: there's two inns that do this, and there's two inns that don't. Uh, Lincoln's Inn do not interview all all applicants, so. Consequently, in my mind, your chances of success of being awarded a scholarship, even though that they've got the most awards, to some extent your chances um, are reduced because they don't interview every applicant. Obviously, only the applicants that they interview are going to get awards. Um, again, there's no, st there's no statistics of what percentage of people they interview, um, but the fact is they don't interview anyone, I guess just because of the sheer volume. Um, 
the closing dates, and I think this is common for all of the of the awards uh, from from what I've researched, is the closing date for BPTC awards is generally the the first Monday. I think it is in November, the fourth of November. Um, Lincoln's in talk about you have to apply in the third year at university or the year prior to uh, commencing BPTC. Information's on their websites, but that's standard for all of them. And the GDL is in May. The closing date is 4th of May. And they're very specific about third year of university or prior to commencing CPE course. Um, so um, May and, and November, and then interviews follow subsequent. So I think that the interviews after May is something like June. And the November ones, I think, if you interviews are in February, something like that, the following year. Um, in a temple. Uh, total awards of 1.3 million, 1.36 million. Um, awards are not fixed um, and not a great deal of information on the, the, the range of awards, but generally they made about 90 major BPTC awards last year. Um, and for CPE, GDL, about 181,000 was made available for that. Um, so you can see that there's much less money assigned to CPE, GDL, uh, scholarships and awards than there are to BPTC. Um, Inner Temple um, has taken the decision since 2008 to interview all applicants. So whether they get the same number of applicants as Lincoln's in, I don't know. I suspect probably not just because they have less awards, the value of the awards are less. Um, but I think clearly you stand more chance because you're not just being judged on your application. You are being given chance to uh, be interviewed. And um, applicants for the 20 th 2013 BPTC year opens in mid-September 2012. So it's always a long way ahead sometimes, these things. You have to you know, think ahead with these things. Don't just think, I'm going to start a course in September and looking for funding. You have to think September a year away sometimes. Um, Middle Temple, we're going down in values now. Um, Middle Temple's a bit secretive and guarded about how much they give. Um, they seem to be quite reliant on fundraising. They talk about fundraising a lot on their website. Um, but it looks like they, in 2011 they, they provided just over a million in scholarships, uh, the majority of which went to BPTC students. And again, like uh, Middle Temple, like, like in a temple, middle temple interviews all applicants. So good to know. So the two temples follow each other, and the application dates for for, for awards are exactly the same as as Lincoln's in May and November for the two CPE is in May, and BPTC is in November. That's the that's the latest dates. Don't forget. And then finally, grazing. Um, grazing is interesting because. Um, they give the smallest amount of awards. I probably think it's the smallest in. Um, 850,000 was awarded last year. Um, but their website is very informative and they break it down by various awards. They've got named awards and they show the whole ranges. So range awards, um, CPE awards were mainly about 6,500. They had nine awards last year of 6,500 each for CPE. And for BPTC there, they had 11 awards of 12,250, they had 12 awards of 14,250. So quite detailed information. Uh, there's no point in me giving you them all, but, um, and they also have a very useful Q&A section. I think, it, you know, if you're going to prepare for, for applications and, and uh, interviews, it's worth looking at their Q&As because they just raise Q questions that you might not think about. Um, and you can prepare yourself the answers and, and just questions that you might want to raise yourself that you may not think to ask. Um, so very useful. And um, application dates the same. And finally, uh, Gray's in, like Lincoln's in, do not interview all applicants. So they only interview a partial number. Again, there is no information on what, what sort of numbers. Um, to close, um, as I'm sure other speakers will tell you, and as you know, um, you don't need to, me to tell you, it's a fiercely competitive market. I think you know, from, from statistics that I've seen from the Bar Council, I think something like one in six, one in five, it's not clear what, what it is, of people who do the, um, 
the, 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 the course will become a barrister um, and therefore funding is, is similarly challenging and, and difficult to get. Um, you need to be realistic about your skills and academic records, but if you're determined and you have the qualities of being, um, you have the qualities the bar is looking for, then there's no reason why you cannot build a successful career at the bar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, if I stand. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> My name is Peter Grossmark. I'm an accountant. I'm a partner with a firm called Silver Levine. We're based in Warren Street, just up the road. I head the barristers team. We act for approximately 1,300 barristers, which is why I've been asked to talk to you today. The main message I had was, um, when do students need to start thinking about employing an accountant? And the answer is, preferably at the commencement of one second six. So, I know that's a way ahead of you, for most of you, I assume, but if we could just take you on a little journey and assume that your pupillage started last September, October, it's about now that we're very busy seeing lots of pupils who are about to commence their second six. And I just want to, in five to seven minutes, just give you a few pointers of important reasons why one should talk to a specialist accountant at this time. Firstly, for people who don't see an accountant and wait till tenancy, they are not registering for self-employment, therefore they're registering late. This can potentially, if it's very late, have penalties, but if not, at least it takes time to get the appropriate reference numbers from the revenue which could hold up the filing of tax returns which could be late in penalties. There's no advantage in being inefficient. As a, a freelance individual, there are potentially four taxes which are relevant, and it's important to be aware of the four of them at that time. They are called Class 2 National Insurance, which is £2.50 a week, and there is a concession that if one is trading, which one is from the commencement of Second Six, or or, or, or training, which sorry, or trading, which you are from that date, you don't have to pay it for six months. To put that application for the concession in, it's important to do it speedily. VAT initially isn't relevant, but one needs to start collating invoices if you're purchasing, and it can go back to your first six as well. Assets, laptops, PCs, wig and gowns. Once one registers for VAT, one can go back three years prior to VAT registration to reclaim the VAT. Just by hanging on to the receipts when you buy your laptop, potentially one can get the VAT back. The next two taxes are called income tax and class four national insurance. These two taxes are based upon the profit that one makes. Now, the profit is the difference between your income and your business expenses. As a specialist accountant, we will make you aware of what expenses are allowable for tax and which aren't so that you can begin to start thinking about those expenses you incur and recording them and keeping receipts for these expenses. We see so many people who, as I said before, wait till tenancy or wait until near the January deadline. Your tax return must be filed by the following 31st of January. I think people will know that from the adverts that are around. And lots of people, because the barristers are deadline driven, wait till the deadline and find, oh, if only I'd kept my receipts, if I'd kept a record. So just by doing some, having a simple spreadsheet, with Silver Levine we provide you with that, to keep a list of the mundane expenses, you potentially save tax in the future. Our reason for breathing is to legally mitigate your liabilities. So it's, we in, make sure that we train all our clients on how to keep their records, what expenses to keep. The choice of one's accounting date. It's natural, perhaps, to think the fiscal year ends on the 5th of April. I'll prepare my accounts to the 5th of April. Again, it's, you've got to be a bit careful as to when your second six starts, but generally we would recommend the 30th of April as an accounting date. It's a very simple decision, but if one doesn't make it and one naively just goes ahead with the 5th of April, you cannot change it. And if you had the 30th of April, as we would recommend, throughout the rest of your working life, and that's a big deal, you would have cash flow advantages. So again, to see an accountant at the commencement of your second six, a few simple points that if you don't know, you don't know them, but if you if you do know, can legally mitigate liabilities in the future. The taxation of the award, as I th we're talking about the Chambers Awards, as you probably are aware, the award you receive in the first six is tax-free, second six is taxable. Now, that when one's discussing with Chambers the award, often Chambers wait them for obvious reasons to the first six. But if you're not aware of that and you just accept what it is without even asking, you end up paying tax on amount you simply don't have to just because you received it a week or two earlier. 
So again, that's another example of simple things that one can do. Okay. My normal presentation, which we do at the inns and other places, takes about an hour on the detail of the tax. I'm, you know, you'll be relieved to hear go through that. All we'd say to you is, whether it's Martin or myself, if you see specialist accountants, we've got leaflets here, we have an initial chat at no cost, so we can point you in the right direction. Um, we both, I think, offer the first year at no cost, and we have discounted fees, as most accountants who specialise in barristers. But I would urge you all, don't leave it late. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm really following on from, from Martin, who gave the fir first talk. Now, now um, what I think I'll do is, first of all, i just outline 12 sources of funding for BPT stu study, um, just to put this into context. What Martin was talking about, in scholarships, are by far the most important form of funding. There's about four and a half million pounds worth of funding each year on INS scholarships. So please make an application for that. And um, uh, as Martin said, said the, the application date is very early in November. It's actually the first Friday in November each year. So broadly, if you are starting your final year of studies, you've got to be thinking about making that application as soon as you get back to university for your final year, because that first of first week of November will come along like an express train and it's very easy to miss it. And it's important for another reason, which I'll explain in about four or five minutes. Now, now the uh, other sources of, of funding are provider scholarships. So, so the BPT school have, may have some. The BPT school, secondly, may have a loyalty discount. Typically that might be about a thousand pounds, but it depends on whether or not you've done prior study at that university or law school. Uh, next, there are prizes. Some of them are national. Um, some of them will be related to the provider. Some of them are half decent. There are some prizes of £5,000, for example, um, and uh, some £4,000. So they're almost as, as good as a, an in scholarship. Next, private fi finance. Now, this is bad news. If you can't get anything else, then actually you've got to pay for it yourself, you and your family. So the other things I'm talking about is basically how to avoid that. I won't go into that in any more detail. Next, you might be lucky enough to have employer sponsorship. For example, you may um, be in the government legal service or the armed forces or something like that, or maybe even a private company, and they'll fund you through the bar school. Uh, and obviously that's great, but it's only going to apply to a small number of people. Next, charitable funds, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Local authority grants is another one. Now, this is almost dead now, but um, the Bar Council website still say that one or two councils apparently give discretionary grants, but um, they're almost unheard of. <coughs> the next one is bank borrowing, and I'll look, talk about this in a bit more detail with you, because quite, there's quite a bit to talk about on that. And the last three are doing some part-time work while you're on the Bar course. Another one is taking the bar course by way of part-time study and splitting the cost over two years in order to uh, make sure that you can get through. And the twelfth form of funding is to draw down some of your pupillage award during your BPTC year. In other words, the award that would be for pupillage, you can actually ask the chambers to give it to you in part prior to even starting the course. Now, um, it, this depends on chambers, but if you get a fairly decent pupillage award, then um, so it, it, so some of the chambers, for example, will allow you to draw down 5,000 or even 15,000 pounds in the year before. Now, I'm not going to refer back to that, but on pupillage awards and so on, uh, there, is, uh, there, there are various publications, that, like this one I think you, you, you have one as well, don't you, which I think is available. With that's yours. That's yours? <laughs> okay, thank you. You haven't got a target on the front, which is... No. <laughs> Very, very modest of you. Um, this, is, this is actually a great book because, because it's divided into all the various chambers and it tells you how much funding is available, how many tenants they've got, how big they are, and how many pupils they take on. So you can work out what sort of competition <coughs> that there is. And if you want a, 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 brief, a, a brief tip, look at the pupillage award for, for chambers as a very rough and ready guide to start you getting to grips with what the chambers is about. The bigger the award, the more important they think they are, and the higher the qualifications they will demand of their applicants. So you, you, you use this sensibly, it'll give you quite a lot of information. Right, now, um, to go back to, to, to a few, few things. Provider scholarships, these tend to be tiny in comparison with the amounts available uh, from the inns. 
for, for example, I'm at City Law School. We, we, we um, award six £3,000 um, scholarships, two £5,000 scholarships, and also BPTC students can apply for general city university scholarships. So it's a smaller amount, but it is an addition to what's available um, from, from the inns. Charitable funds. Now, this is the great unknown. I've brought along this document, which is the Alternative Guide to Postgraduate Funding, um, which you can see is a fairly chunky booklet. It's actually got 94 pages. And it's written by uh, former students who have had some success in tapping into the charitable funds available for, well, for, from actually a very wide range of organisations. There are tens of thousands of charities out there. Now, I think all of you will be law students and you will realise that charitable um, status depends on either religion, which we're not talking about, or the advancement of education, which we jolly well are, or the relief of poverty. Now, you may well feel that you're not going to be in the third category, but just think about it. In your BPCC year, is your income going to be less than your outgoings? And it may not be something <coughs> that you probably immediately think of, but that probably means that even the third category will apply to most students, won't it? Now, this booklet has... Uh, it's actually a great booklet because it basically tells you how to identify charities. It's got a list of about 250 quite well-known ones. But as I say, there are, there are actually tens of thousands of other charities out there which are not nearly so well known, and it has guidance on how to track them down, what sort of uh, resources are available to actually find out addresses and so on. Most of these charities don't have websites, so uh, it's actually a bit of work to find them. But of course, they have to give their, their funds out for their charitable purposes, and it, that might be exactly your circumstances. It's also got things like sample documentation to send out to, to, ch to charities and, and so on. So it's a very, very useful resource if you want to try that particular route. Bank borrowing. Now, bank borrowing falls into three main categories. There's just this, the normal, I'm a customer of a high street bank and I go to the bank manager and ask for an overdraft facility or something like that. I think you probably know all about that. But there are also two other things. There's something called the BPTC Loan Scheme, and secondly, Professional and Career Development Loans. Now, the first of those, BPTC Loan Scheme. Um, the details for this can be found on the Bar Council website. So if you look, look around it, within the vocational training for the Bar, you'll find that there's a section on funding, etc., and they have quite a lot of information about this particular scheme, the BPTC Loan Scheme. It operates through HSBC, the only bank to do so, and the, the gentleman who's actually in charge of this is a gentleman called Mr Ian Jones, and you have to make a personal appointment at the Fleet Street branch in order to uh, take advantage of this. Now, they have a number of conditions, uh, one of which is that you must have demonstrated your ability and commitment by applying to your inn for a BPTC scholarship, hence the point I made a little earlier, the importance of applying for an INS scholarship. If you haven't applied, you're not going to be able to meet their criteria. It is bank lending, it's also unsecured lending, so normally you'd expect for unsecured lending quite a high interest rate, but this one is at the moment 9.9%, I think, or something like that, um, per annum, so, so it's at a um, a slightly reduced uh, amount. They can lend you on the scheme up to £25,000, uh, but of course it depends on whether or not the bank want to. Um, and um, uh, what the basic scheme is, is, is that you get a loan for 18 months if you're on the full-time BPTC, and they won't ask for any repayments during that time, and then you expect it to be paid back in the five years thereafter. In other words, when you start earning in your second six, that's when they'll start wanting their money back. That's that scheme. The, the other scheme is the Professional and Career Development Loan, which is a government-backed scheme. It used to be called a Career Development Loan until relatively recently. And um, adding the two extra words, I'm sure there isn't a direct connection here, has increased the amount that you can get by £2,000, and the maximum is now £10,000. This one operates through four banks, Barclays, Clydesdale, Co-op, and the Royal Bank of Scotland. 
And uh, it's a government scheme, so it's got various criteria, it's got a pegged um, interest rate. One of the great things about that one is that the government agency that sponsors that particular scheme pays the interest during the period of your studies plus a month. Um, it's not available during the GDL year because that's sort of regarded as being equivalent to being undergraduate study, but it is available for the BPTC year. So um, it's, uh, uh, it's a national scheme, so uh, that, that's another way of uh, uh, obtaining funding. I think the last thing I'll just mention is part-time work. Quite a lot of students do actually work while they're on the bar course. Um, obviously, if you're on doing the part-time course, it's far easier to do so because you'll have far less classes. But even on the full-time course, large numbers do. What I'd say is be clear why you're doing it. Is it just to earn money, in which case go for the highest paid job possible with the smallest number of hours and devote yourself to your studies um, so far as you can? Or is it to enhance your CV? And a lot of people do this. Um, obviously, if you can get a job in the legal field, that's great. And the third reason might be to enhance your skills because obviously you're going into a skills-based profession and the job may be giving you that as well as some money. So be clear why you're doing it, but a lot of people do that particular um, thing in order to try to finance matters.